So what I thought I'd do is, this is sort of a continuation of what I talked about yesterday, regarding nutrition and things, things you got to do, things you got to uh, not do, and all the different unfortunate things that happen when you do everything right but something goes wrong. So, obviously a case of greenhouse tomatoes or any hydroponic situation, so we are, we are dealing with, turn that off, we're dealing with a situation where we're providing 100% of the nutrition cell. So if something goes wrong, it can happen on a pretty big scale, unfortunately. All right, when it comes to nutrition, you really need to think about it in terms of balance. So too much is never a good thing. You know that old adage, you know, a pound is good, two pounds is probably better. That is just not a good idea in the case of hydroponics because you can really screw up things very quickly and unfortunately in hydroponics, you don't have a lot of buffering. You know, you don't have a lot of leeway in there. Something goes wrong real quickly, you're gonna see it, the plants, fairly rapidly, and if you start seeing problems with your plants, you end up losing sellable weight. You lose quality, and that's obviously what we don't want to do. So always try to think in terms of balance. So when you talk about nutrition, in, with nutrition, prevention is the key. Double check your math. You know, if you're using this formulation that you, you know, one of the ones from the back of the book in terms of the greenhouse, uh, trend, the greenhouse tomato trend, uh, book, or if you're buying one of the pre-mixed materials, Double check your instructions. Make sure, I know it sounds silly, but I've seen this happen more than one time. Make sure your scale is set to the right adjustment. If it's if you're measure, if you're supposed to measure in grams, make sure it says grams. If it's ounces, make sure it says ounces. So so it's just one of those little things that I've just found has popped up more than more than several times over the last 25 years. So so always double check your math, always double check the formulation you're using. Um, shortcuts are costly. So again, you've got to use greenhouse grade materials. You cannot use commercial grade fertilizers in hydroponics. They don't dissolve in water, or at least they won't dissolve in our lifetime. That's the, that's the problem you run into. So they've got to be greenhouse grade specifically for use in the greenhouse. Diagnosis. If you suspect you've got a problem with nutrition, proper diagnosis is, proper diagnosis is key. So you can spend an awful lot of time and additional money Correct, trying to correct a problem that may not be the actual problem that's out there. So, so rapid is always the method. Is rapid is what you're hoping for. And fortunately, there are ways to do that. So, you know, we can turn around, do leaf tissue samples, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second. We can have the nutrient solution analyzed. Normally, if we're working with a state lab like in Auburn, at our soils lab, we can submit a sample for leaf tissue analysis or for a uh, nutrient solution. If I get it there by Monday or Tuesday, I can usually get the results by Thursday or Friday. So we can have a pretty quick turnaround. So at Auburn, there are $15 for the nutrient solution and 15 for the leaf tissue analysis. So not, not a lot. So when you consider the cost of the amount of fertilizer you're using or may need to use or things you need to change. So most state labs, most all the land grant universities have state labs that you can send these samples through. So, uh, so anyway, so balance, prevention, diagnosis, and ultimately treatment. If there's an actual problem out there, what is the correct method? You know, what do we actually do to correct that particular issue that we see out there? We've already we've had speakers before me, they've already talked about all the different problems you can have regarding pests. So we divide sort of the disorders that occur between the biotic and the abiotic. Biotic, anything that's living, a fungus, a bacterium, an insect that can cause a disease. I'm going to talk about the abiotic, things that are caused by non-living things, things that are related in this case to nutrient stresses. <coughs> There's other things that can cause problems that are abiotic. You know, temperature and relative humidity issues, we can have problems in greenhouse tomatoes such as edema. So if you've ever seen that, it can be sort of dramatic when you actually see it in the greenhouse. But it's not related to anything normally except the environment. There can be some nutritional things, nutritional things associated with it, but it's primarily environmental. We're going to talk a little bit about nutrition. You can also have genetic issues. And the reason I say, just to sort of bring this up very quickly is, there's a lot of folks in, in Alabama that who, grew, who do grow greenhouse tomatoes and maybe some of you do high tunnels. They try to grow heirlooms, some of the old time heirloom varieties in the greenhouse. Problem is they're not really well adapted to the low light conditions in a greenhouse. So when we try to grow these things through, this, you know, through the winter months, they don't perform really well. And a lot of times we'll see problems that will sort of pop up like blossom end rot and issues like that. So it's really related to the genetics of the plant. But the end result that you end up seeing, unfortunately, is blossom end rot. So, so you certainly can have sort of some odd genetic things that, that turn up. Some varieties just are not well suited to a grow in your greenhouse. So you may want to grow it and think it's the prettiest tomato you've ever seen, but if it's not suited for that environment, it's not going to be a very good performer. And you're not likely to get that 
20 or 25 pounds per plant that you're hoping to get off of it. I showed you this formulation yesterday. Regardless of the formulation you use that's out there, it's important to follow that program. You don't want to start with you know, program one and then say, hey, I saw this research from the University of Arizona or I found this information from Guelph in Canada. I'm going to try that formulation and you don't want to change midstream. That can be quite a shock to the plant. So, so when you do start with something, typically you want to follow through, but it's also modifiable. You know, I mean, I showed this. So, but depending on the way the crop progresses and advances and grows, we may start adding a little more fertilizer earlier if the crop has got a really heavy food load and it's really advancing quickly. So, but it's important to stick with the program and know what the program is ahead of time. Have it written down. You know, it's not one of those things you want to run to the internet and say, oh yeah, how much meat do I need to put out there now? You, got, you need to have a plan for it. Diagnosis. When you come with diagnosis in some of these plant disorders that develop, and the nutrients in particular, it is so frequently does not look like the textbook picture. I can't tell you how many times. I wish I could say that absolutely, you know, here's, I'm going to show you some photos here that are actual photos from greenhouses or some from research, um, with some exceptions, so it doesn't always look like what those nice pictures should look like. If you end up having a really serious pH problem, or out there all of a sudden your soil, the pH of your solution's been going in at 5.2 consistently, you may have multiple deficiencies you're actually seeing, so, so it can be sort of muddled when you look at the plant leaves. So, so sometimes just looking at the leaves isn't, isn't always clear. And it is also the position on the plant makes a difference, and I'll talk about that. That depends on, you know, basically how those elements move within the plant affects where these deficiencies and toxicity symptoms will tend to appear, so I'll talk more about that in a second. Leaf tissue analysis, I'm going to talk about that also in the next slide or two. So this is the most accurate way and, and uh, the only way that you can actually identify nutritional problems within the tomato. Aside from just looking at the plant, like I said, that's not really the best way to do it. But this is going to give you, blow by blow, it's going to tell you exactly how much N, P, K, calcium, magnesium, sulfur, manganese, molybdenum, all the microelements. That is the only way to find out exactly what's in there. The nice thing with tomatoes is that we have very defi definitive, or definitive def sufficiency ranges. I know at this stage of growth, we should have this much nitrogen, this much potassium, this much phosphorus. So we can look down that list, and if you're off, you can then go through and you can adjust your fertility program. Some of, these, uh, some of these things can certainly be confused with other disorders, and I'll show you some pictures where looking at that, it may look like a little spray burn, or it may, it may look like a disease starting out, like powdery mildew or downy, or, or downy mildew or something like that, and it may not be, it may be a nutritionally related issue, or it could be spray burn. So just because you see something on those plants doesn't always mean it's, it's definitely nutrition or it's definitely fungal. So it's really going through and trying to identify exactly what the issue is. So. With leaf tissue analysis, um, it's a pretty simple process. What you would do is you actually go through, remember, tomatoes have compound leaves. So that means this whole thing you're looking at, this whole part, is actually like one leaf. And the individual little, little pieces here, those are leaflets, this is the leaf blade. So you actually take that whole thing. Um, normally, most, uh, most labs are going to say, we need between 8 to 10 of these things, but I usually tell growers, make sure you have 12 to 15 in there. You need enough volume of material for them to take it, dry it down, so and then actually analyze the material. So it's usually better to send a few more extra leaves than, than not enough. So, so you do need a finite amount of leaves in there to test it. So you can do it by variety. You will see some variation within variety sometimes, but that doesn't mean there's deficient or there's particular problems. So um, if you've got all the same variety, all the same age within a plant, you probably just need one sample to send off. If you have multiple ages, I would probably look at taking multiple samples. So how often would I say to do that? For a lot of times, for new growers, I think this is, an, this is just an essential key to making sure you're managing your fertility correctly. And I'll, a lot of times I'll tell the growers, like, you know, every two weeks, three weeks, I would take another sample, and this is a way for you to physically track how your plants are doing, to know where you're at. Um, I normally have growers, I'll keep, this is sort of similar to the kind of reports you're gonna get back, and what I do for the growers is, I stick this through a spreadsheet, and what we do is, here's, here's a sample we took on 12.7, here's one we took on 1.12, and we'll just keep adding the results so we can keep tracking it, going by, you know, going by age and age and age. You can use this to look back on. So you can say, man, where was I at last year? Did I have a problem with phosphorus? Was it, what was sort of funky going on? I can look at last year's results. So it's a good for you just to have in your grower's handbook, just to sort of know what's going on. And it gives you a little bit of peace of mind. 
Uh, that doesn't always happen with a lot of borrowing operations, but any way, anytime you can sort of check something on your list, saying, all right, I know my nutrition is where it needs to be. You know, I think that sort of help you, helps you to sleep a little bit out at night. So, so if you do this every couple of weeks, you can really get some good information. And it's going to tell you, it's, there's going to be a sufficiency range. It's going to say that, you know, if nitrogen needs to be between 3.5% and 5% of that sample, so we can look at the way things progress. So do we need to go up? Do we need to go down? So it's going to give you an idea of what's going on. So there's no other way to figure that out by looking at the plant. So, so this is really a key way of diagnosis and tracking the plant health as you go along. It's also a good way to figure out good plants and bad plants. You know, sometimes you may have a row of plants that for whatever reason, this row just doesn't look right. Something's wrong. Maybe it's an outside row. Sometimes when you have outside rows, we get them a little more sunlight. They may grow a little bit more vigorously. Outside rows are also notorious for having problems with mites and some other issues like that. So, but sometimes you see differences within a crop, you know, good plants, bad plants. So you can take a sample from the good ones, the ones that look decent, the ones that look bad, you take a sample, and you can compare them. You can sort of see where you're at between those two different crops. So it's a really useful diagnostic tool. So you know, to be able to make some comparisons. So let's see. Um, keeping a record, going from plant to plant. Does anybody have any questions about that? The one term I didn't mention is this, is hidden hunger. It, this, when I said that typically with plants, there's no way to look at it and decide whether it's deficient or not. Often in plants, what you see today, nutritionally, when you go out and look at your tomato plants today, what you're looking at is a reflection of the nutrition probably eight to 10 days ago. So it can take off for eight to 10 days for these deficiencies to actually pop up, that you can physically see them with your eye. So this plant analysis like this actually helps you reveal these hidden hungers, that hunger that's within the plant that you cannot is not manifested on the leaves, but it's actually within the crop. So, it's, so this, like I said, this is really the only way that you can go figure out what's going on within that crop so and then make adjustments very quickly so that you never do see deficiency. Because when you see deficiency, that usually means one, you know, especially if it's a nitrogen deficiency, deficiency and it's pretty severe, you've already lost weight. You've already lost soluble weight. And you may have also affected quality, especially if it's like potassium. So potassium is really important for fruit formation. If it starts lacking, when you've got a lot of fruit coming on, it'll can make the fruit, and I'll show you some pictures, but it can make the fruits sort of soft, so they end up getting really heavy cores in them and things. So there's, there's a lot of issues that can be associated with this. All right. So you've gone through, you figure out that you've got a problem, and you know you've identified it as a nutritional thing. So what do we do for treatment for this? So what's, what are some of the methodology you go through? First, obviously, you've got to figure out which nutrient is causing the problem. Is it one of the primary or secondary macronutrients? And remember, I showed you um, this slide yesterday. So if you take a whole plant and dry it down, so what you find is that about one and a half percent of dry weight is nitrogen, potassium, one. Then it goes down to the parts per million for all the micro elements. So this is why we put more nitrogen on than we do with calcium. Uh, yeah, calcium or molybdenum or iron or things like that. So, so this also gives you gives you a good idea of why certain things like foliar feeding, nitrogen, potassium, or phosphorus or calcium is not very effective. It's because you would need to get so much of it through that plant leaf. You're very likely not going to be able to meet the plant's demand. So sometimes with nitrogen, you can spray a nitrogen-containing fertilizer on. The plants will green off in the course of a day or two, but you've not met that plant's requirement in the long term. And that's what you're in this for. You're babysitting a crop that's going to be in your greenhouse for nine months or so, ten months possibly. So, so you're in it for the long haul. So instant fixes are really poor, all usually very poor choices in this particular case. So, so when it's coming for NPK, calcium for blossom and rock control, avoid calcium sprays. I've done enough research, and more research has been done in the southeast. Honestly, they're inconsistent at best, and they don't work at, at, for the most part. I wish they did. So, you know, it's still a lot of times you'll find that in recommendations and things for field tomatoes, but honestly, it's hard to get calcium. It's a big, big ion. So it's big. It's hard to get it to go through the plant leaves, and it doesn't want to. You know, so 99% of all the nutrients are taken up by the roots, and that's really where these things need to be. However, on the other side of things, when we look at the uh, microelements, the things that the plant needs in the parts per million total. So you can get away with some foliar sprays for iron or for manganese if you see an issue that actually comes up. So it actually is very effective because you need such tiny, tiny amounts. So you end up spraying a tremendous concentration of those things on, and you get a little bit that actually gets into the into the plant's leaves. So and it actually can help alleviate the symptoms. So so that sort of make where I sort of draw the line between you know foliar applications or no foliar applications. Um, 
let's see, we already talked about these, the macro, micro elements, media application. It, um, a lot of times when I have this issue, this time of the year, I don't know what it is, but um, normally it's, it's really a function of fruit load, the maturity of the tomato crop in Alabama. I will almost always see magnesium deficiencies. It just, this is the time of the year it tends to pop up because of the, basically the fruit load, the environment, and things like that. So when the grower said, well, maybe I'll just spray some Epsom salts. And again, magnesium is not one of those things that really moves across the plant leaf particularly well. The better option is to apply the magnesium sulfate or Epsom salts to play it directly to the media, actually drenching the media or adding some additional magnesium into the into one of your bulk tanks. I'll show you some pictures of that though. When you say you leave to the lab, they give you a breakdown of all these elements? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so normally, like in Auburn's case, you would you fill out a form, you say what it is, what you're hoping to get, and you request something called ICAP, and an ICAP is going to deliver basically all the elements except nitrogen. So you'd say I need a nitrogen analysis and then I need ICAP. The county agents can usually help you, and I know they do it in Mississippi State, it's pretty similar to us. So if you have any problems or you want some questions, you can normally talk to your state lab. Um, there's several private companies that do this, that do it through mail order. It's considerably more expensive. So to do it so, but if you're really worried about a rush or if you're international, you can a lot of times you know deal with those kinds of labs. So so this is a pretty straightforward routine test. And it doesn't matter where you're at in the world, the sufficiency ranges are the same. So you could be in New Zealand, you could be in Australia, you could be in South America, you could be in China. You're gonna get the same sufficiency ranges are gonna be spit out in those reports. So they're stable, it doesn't matter really where you're at. So does that answer your question? Yes. So, all right. So, treatment, all right. Remember again, just because you put it on the plant doesn't necessarily mean that's the form the plant needs. There may need to be some kind of microbial activity to actually break down the nutrients. So, so there's a lag time. So don't expect when you just simply put something out there that it's going to it's going to result in an effect. Normally, if you're trying to correct the deficiency and you're putting it on the plant roots, you're spraying it on, you're not going to see a change typically in the course. For things like uh, for things like some of the macro elements, if you do spray them on, so you want to try that, so you'll usually see a response within the course of four to five days. But for the most part, don't expect to see a significant change for at least a week. So if you want to confirm that the things are improving and think you know the nutrition is, is heading in the correct direction, wait a week to ten days to take another polling analysis, send that off, then compare it to the results that you had a week to ten days prior to that. So there is a bit of a lag time between what you put on there and when you're actually going to see the response in the plants. So confirm that you do have deficiency. This is complicated because a lot of times where I was talking earlier with some folks in the back, so usually when you see a problem, what's your first instinct is? Is to correct, do something. You gotta do something. So but sometimes that something isn't always the best thing to do. So because you know, if is it a fuller, is it a fungal disease? Do you have damage out there that you've seen, you know, you can see damage from things like mites on tomatoes, and you can look out there and it could look like spray burn to you, or it may look like the beginnings of a foliar disease, so actually popping up. So, so correct identification, I, I can't stress that enough. Nice thing is, like, um, a lot of us will do, we've all got smartphones, you can, a lot of times, you can instant message me a photo or something like that, I can take a look at it, take an idea of what it might be, but then I may also turn around and say, look, man, you gotta get a sample of that to the lab as soon as you can, I just, it's just too hard to tell. So, you know, so, so sometimes we can luck out a little bit by telephone, you know, or email and things like that, but if you really wanna get down and be confirmed, you know, confirm it, those are the types of things you do, so. Um, when it comes to nutrition, it's prevention. Everybody should have an EC meter. Everyone should have a pH meter. Those are going to be the two first things I'm going to ask you. If you're growing hydroponically, I'm going to ask you if you suspect you've got a problem or you're seeing a problem, what's the pH of your solution? What's the EC of your solution? What's the formulation you're using? You know, where are you at in your nutritional breakdown from the crop? So those are the things I'm going to need to either eliminate or potentially add some possible, some things that may actually be causing problems. So, so that's really important. So you got to do a little bit of detective work. When you start seeing, I mean, these are these are the top nutritional, top five nutritional disorders that I see on tomatoes, and I've also got some lettuce pictures in here. I'm going to show you as well uh, things that I've seen the last couple of years on lettuce. So, but when it comes to nutrition, again, we talk about the primary macronutrients, the secondary. You know, the, these are the things the plant needs the most of. Then the micro elements. Where they actually, what, how they actually move in the plant affects the deficiency symptoms. So knowing that is really important for you because it's going to help you eliminate some possibilities. 
nitrogen, potassium, magnesium are movable. They move, they get into the plants, into the old leaves, then they move from the old leaves and they move into the new leaves as the plant grows. And if you're not replacing those nutrients, the old leaves become deficient. They'll start running out of those elements. So in a, you know, in a course of a week or so, when you know, if their supplies come off of that before. So this is the one that I really hate seeing out there, because like I said, once you really see it, it's pretty severe. Chances are pretty good that you've affected your yield and the quality. So the plant needs a lot of nitrogen. On average, you know, a tomato plant is going to be out two and a half percent, or a percent and a half of nitrogen on a dry weight basis. So that's a lot of nitrogen. So even a little bit can really slight the plant. So what's going to happen when plants are nitrogen deficient? They're going to shrink. You know, they're typically going to be stunted, or they tend to get leggy. You know, um, they get this light green color on the older growth. Remember, nitrogen is both. So deficiency symptoms are going to show up on the older growth. So, and then the new growth is going to look a little. It's going to look okay, unless of course the, the deficiency actually begins advancing. But nitrogen is mobile. You get this. Typically, the whole leaf begins to yellow. Normally, you don't get like. Normally, you don't see like the leaf edges turning yellow. You see the whole leaf turning yellow. Sometimes, if the deficiency is really severe, tomato leaves will almost appear white. So they'll get they'll get that they'll get that yellow that they sort of on the they pass yellow and they get this whitish kind of uh, look to themselves. But it's pretty dramatic when you look at the leaflets. You know the difference between a plant that has sufficient nitrogen and one that doesn't. So the size can really make a big difference when you're looking at lettuce. So normally when I see a lettuce issue, it's almost always related to pH and the nutrient solution. At least that's been, so far, that's what I've noticed. So normally what you're going to see is the plants are going to be, if the deficiency is going on for a while, the plants will be stunted. They'll be smaller than their, their neighbors that may have had more nitrogen. But in the case of lettuce, normally are going in a flow bed or NFT solution. They're all getting the same solution. They're all the same age. So you may not notice the size change. You know, it's, you may not notice that from, from plant to plant. So it may, sometimes that, that can be a little deceiving. So when you look at them, though, the lower leaves will begin senescing, will begin dying. They'll get an overall yellowish cast to them like this. And you may look at it and say, wow, I wonder if I've got a disease going out there. So and it, you may be getting a disease out there because these nice, this dying tissue is a really good reservoir for some of the, back, some of the fungi to come in and land on and germinate and actually you know, potentially spread a disease out there. So when you look at like different percentages of nitrogen, so Nitrogen really can really radically affects plant growth. So the more deficient they are, the worse the growth gets. So that's this what you're showing here. Here's a here's a lettuce plant that was grown basically two weeks into it with no nitrogen. Then we just simply started increasing that rate, doubling it as we went up to about 53 parts per million. It's dramatic. So and again, if all your plants are under the same nutrition, you may not see this. You can do leaf tissue analysis just to check your lettuce. Normally it's done midpoint, you know, about that point. Well, you feel about halfway down the crop. Then you would take another sample, basically when the crop is done. So that's not going to really help you with that crop you're just harvesting, but it's going to help you with future crops. So if you end up being short on nitrogen or something like that, it's going to be very apparent in those in the mature head. You know, if you're if you're down. Light lettuce is also a quicker crop. You know, 45 days, 50 days, or less. Hopefully, maybe 30 days, depending on the type of lettuce you're growing. So those deficiencies can be dramatic and come on very quickly. And it gets, and it, unless you pick it up at some point by midpoint, there's not a lot you can do. You may have already, unfortunately, caused yourself some problems. With uh, lettuce, since it's again, it's uh, lettuce with tomatoes, it's mobile. This is a nitrogen deficient plant, so they get leggy. It looks thinner. The leaves don't get as large, so you know it almost looks like a, a smaller version of what it should look like. So it, it can be very dramatic when you look plant to plant. But the problem is, a lot of times, all the plants in your greenhouse are being treated the same way. So, so that's why I said sometimes the can be deceiving if you get used to the, what those what the plants look like out in your house. You may not realize you've got a problem, so sometimes it helps to sort of step back, take a look at things, make sure you double check the nitro nutrition, things like that. Take pictures, compare the crop, compare crops to crop, time to time, you know, just to see, get a good idea of what they should look like to you. So you're the one who's going to be out the most time doing the scouting and all those other things. So, so you've got to, you've got to really train your eyes to make sure you can pick up some of these subtle differences. So. When you do see a nitrogen problem on tomatoes or on lettuce, almost always, it, uh, it's almost always related to some either um, mis mix up in terms of the solutions, or maybe in the case of tomatoes, you should have advanced your the amount of nitrogen you put on the crop. Maybe you weren't keeping up with the, the growth of the plants. You just had a lot of sunny days, a lot of good weather. The plants were growing really vigorously, and you needed to sort of advance your fertility program a little bit quicker. Um, with lettuce, it's 
least of all the samples I've seen, it's almost always been pH related. The pH was just simply too low. So once the pH gets low, remember that these elements, they are there, they're in solution, but they can get inverted in forms that the plant can't take up anymore. So if the pH starts going down 5.5, 5.4, 5, 5, 5.3, there is a world of difference between a pH of 5.6 and 5.4, so that's, that's a significant it's sort of a, sort of deceiving when you look at it, thinking it's only two tenths of a point, but it's a 200 fold decrease. It's a significant change from one to the other. So it's important to monitor, maintain these things and track them. So and catch them, especially in the course of a crop that grows so quickly, like lettuce. You know, you really got to stay on top of it. Make sure the pH is okay. Make sure the EC is okay. And again, you know, a lot of people will go through. They end up dumping their dump tanks every two weeks, replacing the nutrient solution with lettuce. That's that's a good way to do it. But it's also a bit of a waste of nutrient solution. So, you know, and what do you do with that 500 gallons of solution? Where do you dump it at? That's becoming sort of a problem in some places. So, so anyway, so with nitrogen, a lot of times it's simply related to the solution that they're in. Maybe you didn't advance the nutrients, the, the, the strength of the solution, you increase it quickly enough, or you've got a pH related problem. So, but it's very correctable. If you correct your nitrogen deficiency, so before you see it, like if it's starting to show up in those leaf tissue analysis you do, those plants are going to respond in the course of three or four days very rapidly. Nitrogen is quick. Nitrogen will respond, and by seven days, seven to eight days out, it's everything is probably just great within the plant. So, so it's it's one of the ones that you know you can you can correct it. It's pretty dramatic when you do it. So, but once you see it, that's always a bad sign. You just, you don't want to ever see it if you can you know obviously can help it. And the only way to prevent that sometimes is to do a leaf tissue analysis and, and look at things and help see how they're going within the plant. Potassium. Um, potassium is probably the second most common thing I see on greenhouse tomatoes. Potassium is also mobile, so it will move from the older plant parts into the newer plant parts, so deficiency symptoms are going to appear on the youngest on the, on the older plant parts. Potassium is pretty distinctive, so you'll see, what you'll start to see are these um, necrotic lesions or spots that will form on the tomatoes. So they usually start on the tips of the leaflets and they'll move inward. Sometimes they'll begin to coalesce or form together. But when you look at this, and honestly, you know, if it's severe enough, and it's usually fairly uniform in the plant, it could look like spray burn, it could look like a foliar pathogen starting out. So, so that's why sometimes it could be a little deceiving. So the extent of the damage you're looking at, obviously in the case of nutrient solution or hydroponics, Chances are pretty good that if one plant has an issue, they all do because they're all being fertilized the same way. And with a with a float beds and NFT, it tends to be very uniform across the board. So if you have a problem with one plant, you know, nutritionally, chances are it's going to be reflected on all the rest of the plants in the system because they're all connected. If it's a disease, or an insect issue, you may see hot spots. Maybe it's starting at the corner where the door is. You've got an external door or something like that. Uh, maybe it's near the fan. So it doesn't, it doesn't tend to affect everything all at the same time. So patterns become important when you're looking at these deficiencies. So the necrotic spots will typically progress inwards towards the main stem. And then as the deficiency gets worse, it's going to move up the plant. So and if it continues and you don't address it, so the deficiency is going to pop up through the whole plant. And if it gets really bad, this is what your leaves begin to look like. So those necrotic spots will begin to turn, will begin to coalesce, they'll dry up and they'll die. So and the leaves will start to curl upwards typically with potassium deficiency. So you get this leaf curling on the leaf edges, they'll begin to curling up. And that's just a physical problem that's happening because of the death of the tissue is just sort of pulling the leaf tissue together and it forces everything upwards like that. So um, what's most dramatic is when you typically see it on fruit that are ripening. So this is the more mostly normal looking fruit, but when you've got potassium deficiency that's pretty severe and you've got a lot of fruit out there, this is what the fruit can look like. They'll get very soft, they'll be almost mushy, they don't develop a nice color to them. So and they usually end up having these really large pores in themselves. So it can really obviously affect your bottom line. That's just not a pretty looking fruit when you've got that. Um, so, but this, so it can be pretty, potassium can be pretty dramatic. Normally, if you look at the recipes that are out there, um, most of the recipes for, for potassium for tomatoes, the, the rate of potassium in there is going to be like in the 250 to 350 parts per million range, depending on the recipe that, that's out there. Normally, when you start seeing serious problems with potassium deficiency out there, most of the references you find will say increase by increase your potassium levels up to 400 to 450 parts per million. So, so it's a pretty big bump typically. So, but that really does. I play around with this. 
developing potassium deficiency that I've gone through, and then I've bumped my potassium levels up, and sure enough, they will bounce back within a week or two. But obviously, those fruit that were affected, you know, if they were potassium deficient, they're going to stay that way. You know, they're not, it's not reparative. What you're doing is correcting it for the future fruit. So, and then, you know, sort of like blossom end rot. Once that fruit has blossom end rot, it's always going to have blossom end rot. You just have to pick it off and work on those later flower clusters. All right, magnesium. So this is the one that I see this time of the year when I see a really heavy fruit load on the crop. And it doesn't matter whether you're growing in pine bark or whether you're growing in croquet bark. I just always see this this year. So a little bit would look like it last, last night, yesterday at the greenhouse we're at. So it, you get this marbling. Um, and again, magnesium is mobile. So the deficiency symptoms are going to start at the oldest leaves and it's going to progress upwards in the plant. But it's pretty bright. You see the veins will stay nice and dark green. But in between that, it gets lightning. So it's very distinctive. So and I said, so it really does stand out when you're, when you're looking at it. When it gets very severe, you can get that some degree of leaf curling like this. So you can sort of see when you're, as you're looking at it, you still get that mosaic kind of pattern on the leaves. When magnesium deficiency gets pronounced, you'll start getting these necrotic spots that will form on the leaves. So and they're typically within the vein. They don't typically cross over the veins. So you get these necrotic lesions. The veins, veins will still stay dark green. The rest of the leaflet will turn this light lime kind of color. So when you get these necrotic spots, that begin developing. So this is just showing you from you know, some plants in the greenhouse what they look like. So this is what I saw last, yesterday in the greenhouse. The leaves look very much like this. So the lower leaves. As it gets more severe, you know, you'll get some degree, you can get some death of the tissue, obviously, some curling. This I just sort of backlit the photo just to make it look really, it's not this never that bright. I just put light behind it so it sort of showed through just so you can see how dark green the veins they are. So of all the ones to pick out easily, this is probably the one that stands out the most to me. So it really it shows up, it's pretty dramatic. And the nice thing is it's fairly easy to correct itself, and it's just using additional Epsom salts or magnesium sulfate form. So um, of all the materials you typically use out there, this is probably the cheapest. When I do see this, and it's pretty severe, what I tend to tell the growers to do is, is again, the foliar sprays of magnesium sulfate are probably not going to work. In fact, I can say with 90% assuredness that it's not going to work. So you make a little effect. Drench the plants, you know, either add, it, add some additional magnesium sulfate into your tank, into your tank A that you've got out there for your tomatoes, or you can go through and you can actually drench the plants. You can dissolve about two tablespoons of magnesium sulfate per gallon of water, go through and treat your plants once or twice, and that's usually going to be, that's usually going to be enough to solve, the, to solve the issue. So you may have to do it later on in the season, but generally speaking, um, this is sort of the quick fix thing. What you want to do is make sure you increase the amount of magnesium sulfate in your, in your bulk tank. So for the, for the long term, so but just the drenching is actually quite effective. So I hear some of the for, uh, people that sell uh, uh, foliage uh, fertilizer. They say that the thing will go in the plant or in the leaf within the next 30 minutes after the application. So would that not fix that? No, no, I, I like to say it does, but I've, I've tried it experimentally and just get very inconsistent results. So that, that's the problem with foliar sprays for the macro elements. For NPK, calcium, magnesium, honestly, it's because the amount you need to get in, you'll get maybe a very localized reaction a little bit, but the problem is it's probably still deficient in the plant. So, I mean, you know, you, you haven't corrected the issue within the plant. So, so, but for micronutrients, yeah, it works. You know, iron chelate, you know, if you have an iron deficiency or manganese issue or a copper issue, you can't get enough in there because you need such tiny, tiny amounts. But, but yes, yeah, so, I mean, I'm not a fertilizer salesman, but I can certainly understand why they say they like fertilizer feeding. But frankly, one, it's expensive. You know, if you look at the amount it costs per unit of nitrogen, you spend a lot of money for foliar fertilizer. So they're very expensive, and they have very limited results, honestly. So when you start looking at university-based research results, it's very poor. You know, I mean, you just don't get it. I can, I can do an experiment with uh, radio labeling nitrogen. I get the nitrogen moved across that plant like urea very quickly in the course of 30 or 40 minutes. Doesn't solve the plant's problem. That's the problem is it doesn't. You just don't get enough of it in there. So you can get some in, some in, so, but you never get enough in to actually meet the plant's demand. So it's got, it really needs to be around you. So. All right. I wanted to talk about two more, calcium and iron, just a couple more pictures. Calcium, I think, is, 
it's a dramatic element, obviously. So in normal, unfortunately for a tomato grower, usually how it shows up is blossom end rot, and obviously that's the thing we don't want to have. Um, blossom, or calcium is critical for growing points. So you normally don't see calcium efficiency like this. This is just a young tomato seedling that was just grown with, not, with no benefit of calcium being added to the soil. So it's pretty dramatic. So the root, the, uh, the growing point, the root shoot, the shoot of the plant actually begins, to, it dies off. It'll grow a little bit, it'll die, the little apical buds will break, it'll start getting this sort of multi-branch kind of look to itself, but ultimately it just fails, it doesn't grow. What's really dramatic is if you actually look at roots, you know, in a hydroponic solution, you can pull up the plant, look at the roots. When you have a really severe calcium deficiency, what you'll typically see is you'll get these, you'll get lots of branching around the root tips. The root tip is where most of the calcium is taken up. And the first thing that dies typically when the plants are being stressed out, so it's the root tip. So anytime you interfere, it's more dramatic when you're in the field, like if you root prune your plants or if it gets too wet or too dry. Those root tips are very sensitive to those conditions, and by killing those root tips, you interfere with the uptake of calcium. So, so it's, it's one of those reasons why we talk about moderating soil moisture, not keeping things too wet, too dry. So that's kind of cycling that can really make lost men rot really make it apparent. When you look at calcium and blossom end rot, so, so it's not just a calcium issue. It may not even be a calcium deficiency. You may have plenty of calcium in your solution, and it could be pH related. You know, the fact is the pH is 5. Your pH is 5 in your solution. Calcium availability goes down to almost nothing for the plants. So it can't, so the calcium is there, but the plant can't take it up because it got converted to a form. The plant can't take up anymore. So. You can't, you can't escape these three things. It's, it's, I've always found it useful to sort of look at this of uh, boss man rod as sort of a three-legged stool where you, you deal with calcium availability. You know, is there enough calcium in the system? The second thing is, is the pH, whatever the pH of the, the system is. The third uh, is, the soil, is soil moisture. So, or moisture of the media, you happen to grow it in, in there. If any one of those three things sort of goes out of whack, you can develop boss man rod. So, you know, if the pH is too low, calcium, even though it's in the soil, we can get a loss of enron. If you end up in your bags, you're growing them in coconut core or something like that, or perlite, and they dry out too much in between irrigation events, I can almost guarantee that if you've got fruit developing out there in the course of four or five days, you're going to start seeing loss of enron developing on those tiny little fruits out there. So, so it's, hey, this is probably the, that, like I said, that sort of three-legged stool analogy. If any one is shorter than the other, that can really make a difference in lost men rot. And there's also a variety of difference. Most of the greenhouse tomato hybrids that we deal with right now, they, the breeders have selected against the propensity to develop lost men rot. So, so there's obviously a genetic component involved as well. Um, a lot of the hybrids that, and open pollinated uh, varieties that people try to grow in the greenhouse, they're just not really well suited. If I, want to, if I really want to have lost men rot in the greenhouse, to study it experimentally, if I grow some of the um, some of the heirloom tomatoes in the greenhouse under low light conditions, I'm going to have it. I, I can almost guarantee that I'm going to get it in there. So, 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 like I said, so there is certainly a varietal part to this as well. But um, obviously, this is pretty dramatic. So, and what you're seeing at the you know at the blossom end of the tomato root, that is a growing point. The tomato grows from that blossom point. That's where it expands from. So, if it runs out of calcium, it can't make cell walls any longer or the cell holes aren't particularly very effective. So you end up with these uh, leathery, sunken spots, which are really excellent places for rotting organisms to get into. That's why it's important to get them out. You can't make them better. You can't spray calcium on there. You, you know, even adding additional calcium in the system will not correct what's already been damaged. Plants can't correct those, the fruit. They can't repair the fruit. So you have to get them off there. It's hard to do, and it may be heartbreaking, but they're not going to develop in anything. So when it comes to boss men rot and issues with calcium, so it's prevention. Making sure that the pH of my solution is in that 5, 6 to 5A range, and it stays that way. It never drops below that, because if it does, that's where you really end up having some of these serious problems. So make sure you've got the correct amount of calcium nitrate in your solution. So that's usually a primary component. It's out there, and it's one of the major sources that we use for um, tomatoes so, and, and, and in uh, lettuce. So, so making sure we've got the calcium out there, you can check your calcium in your tank normally for, for uh, tomatoes. When you, if you measure the solution that comes out at the end, 
that's going into the plants. You really want to see that calcium in that 125 parts per million range. If it's below that, you may end up having some problems. If it's really below that, you can really have some significant problems. So but when you start looking at all the little formulations that are out there, this is a pretty typical range for most of the solutions for a mature crop that's putting on a lot of fruit. So, so that's one way you can check, and how you check that is you can take the sample, send it off to the lab, you know, for analysis, and they'll tell you exactly how much, much how much calcium is in that solution. So, so prevention is always the key. Again, if the CA pH is too high or too low, uh, have a nutrient solution, you, you can end up having a really serious problem with the calcium and rot. And then just you know, irrigation timer. Every so often, our irrigation timers fail. Every so often, we may not recognize it early on, and then all of a sudden, you see it. You correct it, but then four or five days later, you start seeing blossom and on your fruit. And it, you know, it's just the end result of which you've seen, you know, that plugging up the emitter. So, so maintaining my emitters, maintaining the irrigation system, making sure the, the timers are working correctly, all those things play into, into, into effect. So Max talked yesterday about making a checklist. This is just part of your checklist of making sure things are working correctly. All right. Talk about that. Last thing I want to talk about, does anybody have questions on the blossom or calcium? So I can't say that I've seen a calcium deficiency on lettuce. So I, I, I've seen it in photos and things like that, but I, I just haven't seen it as a, as a crop yet. So, But I have seen iron deficiency in lettuce, and I've seen it in tomatoes. So it's probably, I think it's really one of the most common on tomatoes. So um, it's really common on field tomatoes, believe it or not. So especially if you're using a lot of copper fungicide, so it can, it can be pretty dramatic towards the end of the season. So iron is immobile. Iron will, once it gets into that older plant parts, so it does not like to trans, it can't translocate from the old plant parts into the new plant parts. So if you're not replacing iron, you run out of iron, the deficiency symptoms are going to show up in the newest growth on the top of the plant. It'll almost be lime green on tomatoes. It'll, you know, it'll come out. The new growth coming out of tomatoes should be significantly darker than this. So when, if you see, a, if you uh, if you exit the building, well, actually on either side, there's some ornamentals. Some out here, I think it's ornament. I don't remember what it is. But, um, out this side, there's some azaleas on this side that are showing it. They're showing iron deficiency, iron chlorosis on the new growth that was coming out. So it. Sometimes that just happens early in the season because with iron there's a microbial component to it. Got to you know sort of warm the soil to make the soil available. But in the case of tomatoes, it's, it's pretty brilliant. It shows up. It's one of the real common ones you can see out there, and it's actually relatively easy to correct. So which is nice. So but, you know it, I have played around with it a little bit. I haven't seen a big like uh, you know I induce it. You know you, you take the tomatoes, you cut off the iron from the solution. And within about eight days, you'll start seeing symptoms that'll show up like this out there. Then I'll correct it. And it really had no impact on the yield for the tomatoes that I was playing around with. So this was just a pretty small scale thing. So, so, but obviously, if I let it go on too long, so you can run out. So despite the fact that you only may need a few parts per million of this, or you need one and a half percent nitrogen to complete that plant, they're all equally important. Anytime one of those is limited, it's going to limit the growth of the plant period. So, so they're all equally important. You can't say just because this need a lot of this, you know, that's more important than iron or magnesium or something like that. So they're all equally important. So they're all needed at this at, at their proper levels to complete the plant. So, so anyway, so iron's immobile. So it's pretty dramatic with this lime green kind of foliage you're going to see. It's going to typically get that yellowing corrosive to the younger leaves. It's going to progress upwards towards the tips of the plant. The green, the, the veins tend to remain green in this. So. This looks a little bit like magnesium deficiency. The difference is it's on newer growth as opposed to older growth. With lettuce, um, I should have put another picture in here to sort of compare it. This is Rex, so it's a bit lettuce. So it's, it's one of the more common ones that you're going to see typically grown around. So, and the plant is iron deficient. So eight days ago, we cut off its iron supply, and this is what it ended up looking at. I'm going to show you the side picture of this too. But So you've got this uniform. This should be a nice dark Kelly green. And said it's sort of this emerald kind of color. So you get a little bit of intervenal yellowing the veins. The veins don't really, you see they're a little bit darker, but not quite as dramatic as the rolling tomatoes. If you look at a side view, so it's pretty dramatic. It's a much more rapidly growing plant. So a little bit of change really, really affects the growth of the plant in a short period of time. So the top portion of the plant almost looks miniature. It looks short. So it's short, the inner nodes are a little bit shorter, the leaves are smaller, and it's got an overall more yellowish kind of cast to it. So, so it's, uh, 
and I see this in float beds, and, I, uh, and sometimes I think it's related to the time of the year when the solution gets really cold, and the, the temperature does affect the availability of iron in the solution. So you may have enough in there, but if the solution is at 55 degrees because it's 55 degrees in your house, that's too cold. So, and that really can shock the plants, and that's where I've seen this. I've also seen this in aquaponic situations. So if you, we have a few aquaponic growers in Alabama, and whatever the particular there's a lot of chemistry associated with this and particular issues that show up. I can almost guarantee it that in the springtime and the fall, I'm going to see iron deficiency in your plant. So it's just one of those things that you seem to have to deal with. There's a lot of chemistry associated with it, but it's, it's surprisingly common. So. But it's very bright. It shows up like that. You can see the older green leaves here. They look, look that the green color they should be. So when you start looking at the upper growth, so it's pretty dramatic. So. So it's, it's pretty dramatic, obviously, when you see it on your plants because you don't ever see this on your plants. But it's easy to correct. The nice thing with iron is, um, since it's needed, it's a micromillin, you can spray iron chelate. You can, it's a chelate form of iron. It's fairly, it dissolves very easily in water. There's a lot of different formulations of it. There's also iron EDTA that can be used. They're actually not that expensive, and you're only using a very small amount. You can put about a quarter of a teaspoon per gallon of water. You can soak the plants. So with that, I'm sorry, or you can spray the plants with that, or you can put about one and a half to two teaspoons of iron chelate for 100 gallons of water. You can sort of figure that out. Your spray tanks, you know what that ends up being. So there's a lot of good, there's, there's ways you can figure that out mathematically of how much that ends up being. This is this is sort of a shortcut version that I've shown you up here. So, so you can spray the plants with the iron chelate, and frankly, one application is usually going to be enough. It'll start to green up, and it's going to look normal. Some growers like to do a second application just to make sure. You know, so but it's probably a little overkill, quite frankly. So. so, but it's surprisingly commonplace, and where you see this in tomatoes mostly is if you, you, you it can really be a problem when you overwater. Just too much watering, keeping that media too wet, so it, and it almost gets waterlogged. But fortunately, most of the media that we use, that's not a major issue. So, but but certainly depending on the media that you might be using, if it's holding too much water and it's stay, you know, you can really end up with a problem with, with the iron deficiency. So. But that's the one that I've seen the most. So of all of them. So, any questions about that? No. Yeah. All right. I think overall, really, when it comes down to it, is is looking at patterns. So with the mark with the nutrient deficiency again, you're typically going to see a problem on a large scale. It's going to be the whole greenhouse, or it's going to be everything is connected to that particular injector system where those that dump tank. It doesn't tend to be just a couple of plants here and there, and then it looks like it's spreading. So patterns really make a difference when you're trying to identify uh, potential problems out there. So all your analysis, I can't underestimate how important it really is, honestly, for prevention and for peace of mind. So it's fairly inexpensive, and it's going to give you a world of useful information that you can track your crop health with. So, and it's really the most reasonable way to adjust your fertility program because things are going to get deficiencies and toxicities will get identified fairly quickly when you do a full year analysis on your crop. You can do that in conjunction with a nutrient analysis. If you mix up your nutrient, you follow the instructions, and if you're trying to double check, making sure everything came out right. So you can submit that to a lab as well. They can send, and they'll send you a report, and it'll show you the exact, you know, the ingredients, all, you know, based on how much NPK, etc. So you can double check your math that way. So because whatever you put in solution, normally when you're following a formulation, it's going to have a there's going to be a mathematical formula you can figure out exactly how much, how much of each of those elements are going to be in that solution that you've done. So it's a little bit more math associated with it, but you can figure that out. And then you compare what you got number-wise to what you actually got when you get the analysis done. So if you want to just check your math to make sure, you know, to double check yourself, that's not a bad way to do it. And it can help give you a little bit of peace of mind. Follow your fertility program. I can't stress that enough. Don't make major changes midstream. Or if you do, you really need to justify it. So, you know, and the best way to justify it, obviously, is with some analysis and seeing what's in there, what's not in there, and make some changes. The most overriding factor of issues or problems that I tend to see is our pH-related issues. So the pH is simply dropped too low. Most of the materials that we use, the, the natural inclination for those materials is for the pH to drop over time. So you're going to end up having to compete with that and raise the pH. And there's a lot of materials out there for use. Depends on what you're comfortable with. So, in the case of tomatoes, normally we're mixing it up a batch at a time. Most, you know, most growers don't use large oil tank for their tomatoes. At least small growers, some certainly do. You know, so sometimes it's a little easier to tweak those situations. That is, when you're growing in a float bed or when you're growing um, in NFT where you have a large volume, 
that you've got to correct the pH, and so it can be a little bit more troublesome. So, and checking water quality. Water quality is also obviously probably the most, the second most important thing next to what are you going to do with it once you grow it, and you know how you're going to market it. Water quality is key. You know, get your water tested before you start growing, so you understand its characteristics, and if you have to do something, you just pH, or if you end up having you know hard water, soft water, uh, if you have a lot of dissolved salts in there, you have a lot of sodium in the water. Those are all things you can deal with in your situation, but it's kind of stuff you don't want to find out after the fact that you got a problem there. So because it's really hard to go backwards. So what you're growing. All right. Any questions? Any comments? Yes. Um, you said that a potassium deficiency caused a big four in the tomatoes and a, a, up into 400 to 450 parts per million. How long will it take after I get my levels there for that four to go away? Do you have any idea? The core won't go away. Uh, What's the first? All the other I mean, they probably are affected to some degree or another. So it's going to depend on how mature they are, you know, and as to how much correction you can get. So, but once the plants, once the fruit get to the point where they're, they're really sizing up, I'm not sure how much of improvement you can really see. So, but obviously, the smaller they are, the more likely you're going to have success when you actually do alter it. So, that's a pretty extreme, extreme example of what I showed you. Normally, it never gets that bad. I have it. Really? I've had it in the past, I've had it, yes. And cores can also be related, you know, that, that core can also be related to temperature and variety, too. So some varieties, unfortunately, just produce very large cores, especially when you have high temperatures. As you get closer in the springtime and the summer, so sometimes some varieties will just get larger cores than other times. So sometimes it can, that can, it can be related to that as well. So, so even, you know, trust in the summertime last year, I had a grower, he was probably pushing mid-June, so, and we went out there and cut a couple of his tomatoes open, and he had some pretty pronounced cores in them, and that normally doesn't form a significant core. Yeah, you know, so, so, so some of it could be temperature. So what level do I need to keep my potassium at to that not to happen? Keep it at the, between the four and four? Most of the recipes I look at, what you're going to see is going to say between starting, most of the recipes, and like the one I got up here, if you follow the recipe I showed, so it ends, I think it ends up being like 275 parts per million. So it's, it's, so it's jumping it up to 100, another 100 per million, parts per million or so. So, but there's a couple of formulations like, um, uh, if you look at the one from Hydro Garden, there's is high, it's like 400 parts per million. So, you know, so I think you've got some leeway, frankly, in there. So. It's safe. So, you know, one thing we want to do is go much above that, so because I don't know what it would do. So, because you definitely, with any of these, too much is never a good idea. So, and it's expensive. Every time you add something, you get more dollars that come out of your pocket. So, yeah. Uh, so, have, have you ever used these in house meters that test petiole sap and nitrate and for phosphate? I came in late, so I don't know if you talked about this or not, but as far as an in house, um, diagnostic tool. Do you have any experience with these types of meters? I know they're used in the field. Um, and also leaf spat, uh, a measure of spat meters. Yeah. Concentration. Yeah, this, as far as a, um, a way to tell that you know, maybe the plant is like a little nitrogen deficient or deficient in some element. Um, any, any comments on, on that? For um, greenhouse tomatoes, they're actually, I think, actually George Hoffman in Florida actually has some data on leaf petiole sap. There's a specific, there's ion specific readers you can buy them, carbon meters. There's a couple companies that make them. They'll test nitrate, they'll test potassium. So they're, they're out there, and, and it's a matter of you take sap from the petiole, which is always a challenge when it's made to try to squeeze sap out of the petiole. But normally it's got like a little garlic press kind of thing. You get the material, you put it out there. You can't compare those ranges to like the sufficiency ranges from ICAP. From, from what I showed you up there, they don't compare you know, directly. But, and you know, there is some limited data out there, at least on tomatoes for nitrogen and potassium from Florida. So actually, on, on using those ion-specific cards, and those cards are like 150, 200 bucks, depending on which one you get. You know, they're fun to play with, but I, like I said, unless you've got a range to compare it to, it's just not useful. But I think, you know, if you're really, you can get ion-specific, you know, um, uh, devices that you put in your nutrient solution as well. So, so I, I've not played with those, but certainly they're out there. So, it, you know, if you're trying to make a comparison crop to crop, you know, and keeping data and looking at things and seeing how they grow, it's a quick way to do it because you take a couple of drops and you get the reading instantly. So, but I, you can talk more about that, but the, the nitrate, like I said, the nitrogen one, or the nitrate one, the potassium one, what was the other one you mentioned? The phosphorus. Oh, phosphorus. Yeah, phosphorus. I've never played with those. So. Do, you, do you have any ideas? The, 
the accuracy of the meters or no, no. So you know, when you try to compare them to like the standard ICAP and things like that, so they don't. No, like so you, you can't find like the direct. It's, it's hard to you know when you when you plot the results typically. So it, there's there's no good direct correlation between the two things. And I think that's always been the sort of the limiting factor in using them. So so, but you know, for specific crops, you can find specific guidelines certainly for field tomatoes. And like I said, there is a little bit of information for Florida on greenhouse tomatoes. So I've just never played with it. Okay, thanks. Sure. Yes. Accepting that you have the wrong cultivar in your greenhouse uh, for five cluster tanks, so if we're not getting no changes yet tomorrow. So yeah. no. um, we are seeing blossom end rot. Can we just bump the calcium incrementally to, to try and pull that back? Because it's not a whole cluster. It's it's not a whole row. It's you know, spread out through. It's sort of sporadic. Yeah. There's so I think the first thing I do, if it's all the same variety, I would certainly get a lead tissue analysis done. I think that would be the first thing I would do when I get back. So are you growing in the media? Like my bar, my bar? I think I think there's a couple things I'd do. One is I would do a lead tissue analysis because I'd like to see where the calcium is at. So the second thing is I would probably also submit a sample of the leachate, which comes out of the Cause of the modeling pots. I would collect that as well as maybe a sample of what goes in. Sometimes it's useful to see what goes in and what comes out, just to make sure, you know, just to see if there's some absorption and any changes like that. That sort of will give you sort of a picture. So, but some varieties, like I said, they, you know, if your watering is even, you're not too wet, not too dry, um, if the temperatures are okay in the greenhouse, you know, it's not 90 degrees consistently um, or too hot at night, you know, if you're keeping all the temperature you need to be. Some varieties, like I said, if it's, it's some, unfortunately, some of those heirlooms in low light situations, they just don't perform well. So, you know, you know all you can do, you can, I, you may have some flexibility in how much calcium, more calcium you add. The lead tissue analysis is going to tell you, so, because you can definitely hit an upper limit for any of those, so.